And it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Dr. Julia Clark. Um, in talking with Julia, who I've known for a long time now, I'd like to add that this is the third Hot Science Cool Talk that she's given. Um, she's amazing. Once you get asked back for, to do more than one, you are in a very rarefied atmosphere. And so in talking with Julia over time, finding out what, how'd she first get excited about science? What was it that, that did it? Was she like a dinosaur nerd as a kid and she always knew she wanted to do it? What was it? She said, no, she just was always really into like exploring and discovering things. She'd go into the backyard, dig things up. She'd go down to the creek, turn over stones. She was always looking to explore and discover things. And she said it was kind of like uh, the Indiana Jones movies. For those of you who are not dated by that reference, and she also would point out, even though that's what drove her, she, once she became a scientist, she realized that's not, that's not how science works. But in any case, that was an inspiration for her. And Julia is the Wilson Professor of Vertebrate Paleontology in the Department of Geological Sciences here at UT. She is also the first Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Jackson School, a brand new position that was created a couple of years ago. And Julia became the first person to fill that position. Um, she was also recognized as a leading scientist and educator by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and this led to a million dollar uh, award for her to develop new geoscience education programs at the undergraduate level. So she's both widely recognized for her diversity work, she's widely recognized for her educational work. Oh, and oh yeah, she's also a leading researcher who's been involved in some of the biggest discoveries in the evolution of dinosaurs, birds, and the origin of flight. And it's uh, really quite a, quite a triumvirate of things that she does between diversity, between education, and her research. And I'd also like to say one more thing about Julia, that her work takes her, I just wanna get these countries right, her work takes her to discover these things in Peru, Chile, New Zealand, New Zealand, Antarctica, Mongolia, and China. So she got to be Indiana Jones after all. So tonight she will regale us with a dinosaur's roar. Please welcome Professor Julia Clark. Thanks, Jay. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, that was quite an introduction. And I want to point out that I recognize that it's not science in Indiana Jones movies, okay? And there's a lot of stuff I do not approve of. But I did love Discovery as a child. And it is such a thrill. Thank you to Jay, and I want to thank D-Day, who made a lot of stuff happen with this event as well, with ESI. And um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to be with you. And just think, we're out on a Friday night talking about science, right? <laughs> Pretty awesome. So let's get into it. So sound, can, sound to us is so many things. From the call or a laugh or a cry, right? The sound is something that is truly transformative. And we know this as humans with language, with the way we communicate with one another, the way we emote to each other. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, but I'm going to think about sound as it relates to dinosaurs. So this is me. You've already met me. And I've been privileged to have support for some of the work that I'm presenting from a variety of awesome um, science supporters over the years. But I want to jump right in, because I know why you're all here. You're not here for this. You're here for dinosaurs. So ever since the first discoveries of dinosaurs, you see uh, we envisioned interacting with them. We envisioned what they might look like if they came up, right, on the side. But those visions were largely mute. We would envision them here, you know, interacting with humans. And did dinosaurs ever interact with humans? Okay, I have to put a caveat. These dinosaurs did not interact with humans. But you, as you'll see from this talk, can go interact with dinosaurs in your backyard. Well, huh? What am I talking about? All right, we're going to get there. So as soon as dinosaurs hit the talkies, the movies with sound, it was a very different story. So
So although this was filmed in Spain, envisioning Texas cowboys, you know, lassoing a dinosaur, what's that sound? What's that sound that we hear in those first movies? Make it. All right. So right up to the more recent Jurassic Park movies, we see the same thing. What are we going to hear? Okay, I want you to notice two things with those dinosaurs, right? Rawr, right? What is the facial expression that we're making as humans when we make those sounds? And it sounds like what kind of animal that you might find in the world today? You can yell it out. A lion, maybe? So this is one of the fiercest carnivores that we have around today. And you can see it's a wide open mouth making that sound. But when we think about this, we can also see how sound in this vision of dinosaurs roaring has influenced almost every little toy to an image of a dinosaur. Their mouths are open. They're ready to roar. So one of the, the behaviors that we associate is this open mouth roar with dinosaurs. Well, we're going to dig in on that tonight. So how do we start thinking about dinosaur sounds? I'll tell you the first key science clue. We need to think about living animals, because if we don't think about living animals, how are we going to imagine what that sound might be like in the past? So our first visions, this is one of the earliest illustrations of a dinosaur. They look kind of like lizards or things closely related to lizards. Big lizards. But in fact, the animal I just showed you, Sphenodon, is more closely related to lizards and snakes than it is to extinct dinosaurs. So extinct dinosaurs are well nested within a most recent common ancestor that includes crocodilians, not lizards, and birds, both very noisy groups of animals, as we're going to see. So if we look at our living dinosaurs and our, ex our cousins of living dinosaurs, we can learn certain things about them because they're going to tell us what was most likely present in extinct dinosaurs. But you can see from this clip I'm about to show you, this is real commentary on the first sounds that were brought to movie Jurassic Park uh, dinosaurs. And the only one mixed in to a sound that this dinosaur is going to make is an alligator, but most of them are mammals like lions and baby elephants, and the sonic booms are the footprints of the dinosaur. But listen to what this he's about to say, because I want you to start thinking about dinosaur sound making in a new way. After this movie came out, I got a call from someone from the press asking if I would respond. There was a scientist in Japan who had done research on what dinosaurs sounded like. He said that I got it all wrong. And that his claim was that the T-Rex would not roar because it was not a mammalian predator. It was something different, something more bird-like. And it would not have roared. The only sound he said the T-Rex would have made would be the gurgling of its stomach. And they asked for my response, and I said, it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine the scene if, you know, <laughs> it was mostly about indigestion and... <laughs> so, I really like this clip because it forces us to think about a whole field of research which is very different from paleontology, which is called animal behavior and animal communication. And imagine the size of that T-Rex's stomach. I think we might have heard that, but I actually have never heard a living dinosaur's stomach rumbling the way our mammal stomachs have. So we have to think about the contexts in which dinosaurs might have made sound. So what do we know about these sounds when they're made in these close cousins of dinosaurs and living dinosaurs, and what do we know about when they make them? Well, the first thing we know is that one of the most important contexts, and we think this would have been present in all dinosaurs, is the communication between babies and adults. So baby crocodilians make sounds 
to their parents, their parents bring them food. And this is really important because if you're interested in dinosaur behavior, you've got to be interested in animal behavior. So babies and adults communicating for food. Another very important context is mate attraction or signaling or getting a territory that might uh, be larger kind of uh, to attract a mate. So we call this all part of sexual selection. And that's another context which we know in these cousins of dinosaurs was very important. So I like to say Jurassic Park, if they'd gotten it right, might have been more like a rom-com. Right? <laughs> so let's think about the context of this sound making. We already watched this clip. We're going to see it again. OK, presumably this large dinosaur wants to consume these small children. Why is it making sound right now? That's not a stomach rumbling. That's not some indigestion. That's a, that's a scary sound. And the reason that sound exists is actually to scare us. It's not really a context in which predators make sound. If you think about it, predators want to creep up. They want to get over there and get a meal. And if you exhale and then try to eat a whole cheeseburger, or in this case, a small child, not going to work very well. So most sounds are, are created on the exhale. Well, let's look at our, our dinosaur cousins, crocodilians. So I'm going to play you a sound. I think it's pretty scary. Ooh, kind of roar-like. That's a sound actually made by crocodilians, which are much more closely related to dinosaurs. Let's look at this video. And you can't hear the sound, but it's going to be that same sound, but it's created at, there's two different frequencies in this. One is just in our hearing band, which we hear at the end of the call. And when you see the water dance display, that's what's called infrasound. That's below human hearing. That's a sound that you feel as a human, but you don't hear. And in fact, we couldn't create that sound in this studio because we need speakers about the size of the state, this area up here, to get accurate low, low frequency sound. So we're going to come back to that later on. But the key thing I want to tell you right now is, and I hope I didn't zap someone with a laser pointer, is that both of the sound, the sound I just played, and the infrasound are created when these crocodilians have their mouth completely closed. OK, so all the sounds that crocodilians make, except if you were to pick up a baby and it went, ah, then all the other sounds they make are closed mouth sounds. So actually, this is not uncommon in living dinosaurs. So here we see a male ostrich doing what's called the boom call. And this is um, where essentially you can see it looks like the neck is inflated. But this sound is made with the mouth, what I say is wide shut. And all of these other things that you see inflated, those are the esophagus. So what is happening here is that sound is being shaped by in f changing the, what's called the vocal tract. Let's look at that. So just to get into a little tiny bit of anatomy, we have the esophagus, which goes from our mouth to our stomach, and mammals. In mammals, it's muscular. So we can eat upside down. Peristalsis is going to move that food to our stomach. Not the case in a crocodilian or in a bird. A crocodilian can eat a hu whole human can go in there, that esophagus can expand. In birds, they can eat a whole bag of french fries. You might have seen a gull do that on the beach, and it goes down the esophagus. So the esophagus is not muscular, but it can be blown up, like you see in this dinosaur here, which is called esophageal inflation. Pretty crazy, and if I've lost you, just think about a T-Rex doing something like this. So we'll come to that in a moment. But esophageal inflation is only possible because there are no muscles in the esophagus. So what is the importance of that? Well, this is what's called a vocal tract modification. That sounds really technical, but right now my vocal organ, as I'll come back to it, my sound maker, is making a hum. 
But all the sounds that you hear are because I'm changing my vocal tract using all these fabulous muscles around my face. So the way these dinosaurs are doing this is they're changing the shape of the tract, which filters out and emphasizes certain frequencies, as you can see. Oh. You can see, hopefully, right here, you can see in the lower corner, is that the tract modifies the frequency produced by the vocal organ itself. All those birds, including our white-winged doves here in Austin, use esophageal inflation. So if you hear them cooing, coo, 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 not an open mouth, mouth is completely shut and they've blown up their esophagus. I hope you never look at a white-winged dove dinosaur the same way again. So what we noticed when we did this study, which ended up, I think, on the, it was Colbert or one of these shows, um, was that this, this blowing up of the esophagus was seen in birds, living dinosaurs, that differentially produce low frequency sounds. Okay, this is going to be important. We'll come back to it. So the lower FO is fundamental frequency or pitch. So what we did was optimize the probability of what extinct dinosaurs have. Would extinct dinosaurs have more likely have had closed or open mouth vocalization? This is not going to be, <laughs> it's about 50-50. But what we found when we looked at all living birds that, it, that show this behavior is that it is always associated with increases in body size. And I'll ask you guys this question again. Are, are most extinct dinosaurs big or small? Big. big. And the living dinosaurs are mostly small. But big dinosaurs showed having this blown up esophagus and associated with lower frequency sounds. So we changed the way dinosaurs looked. And as we'll see, we changed the way people are, are bringing them to life in museum ex exhibits. So one other thing that you might have heard, and this was like the only piece of science around dinosaur vocalization when I got started in this work, is that there are some species of dinosaurs that have tubes in their skull. So these tubes in their skull are circuitous, and what people can measure is what frequencies would they filter out, and what frequencies would be amplified. And it, spoiler alert, lower frequencies. But what this shows us is that there were dinosaurs that had these modifications for sound, just certain groups of dinosaurs very distantly related to birds that are not seen in living birds. So no living group of birds has these kinds of tubes in the skull, but they do this thing in a different way with their esophagus and with different kinds of modifications. So we come back to this picture of all our dinosaurs with their mouths hanging open. And what are we going to say? OK, possibly. That was, a good, that was a good comment there. So we can say nope, but we can also say possibly. Because is it more, do we only see it associated with large-bodied dinosaurs? And are most extinct dinosaurs large-bodied? Yes, they are. But in living birds, Open mouth vocalization is common, but most birds are very small. So that's something to think about. So we can conclude that many, possibly, right, dinosaurs use this modification that emphasizes low frequency sounds at large body sizes. And where do we go next? Well, let's think. If we go to Jurassic Park, we can see they're influenced by that early science on nasal tubes, but they got it wrong. So let's look at what they have to say. Because some of the technologies they're talking about are technologies that we use today, but um, are interpreted very differently. I give you the resonating chamber of a Velociraptor. Listen to this. What do we think about that? It's strange, though. It really is. 
Because the velociraptors are already going to get them. <laughs> All right. So here they've taken the concept of a resonating chamber, but misinterpreted it as a sound maker rather than a sound shaper. The sound they used is actually the sound made by crocodilians with the mouth completely closed. So the sound they put into that resonating chamber is actually a sound made with the mouth closed in crocodilians. Let's go to the next. So we need to talk about sound makers. So now you know a resonating chamber shapes sound, but a sound maker is something that makes sound. So how do animals make sound? Well, one way they make sound is what's called mechanical sound production. And that is about this or the sound that your wings make in a whistle or rubbing two things together. That's mechanical sound production. But what we're going to focus on today is the mode of, of sound making that I'm using to speak with you today. So in this case, we have vocal folds that are located at the end of our airway that are going to vibrate. And these are real squishy real soft and they're supported by cartilage because something's so soft it needs to have a support structure and that's up at the end of the airway so this is what we're going to talk about next sound makers i once touched one of these models of a human vocal fold super gross softer than jello okay very squishy but it's attached to cartilages which give it rigidity why are we talking about this? Well, in fact, the vocal organ I'm using to, talk, to make sound that's shaped by my vocal tract to talk with you is present in all these other creatures, frogs. And it makes, it's, it's used in vocalization in bats, in, in geckos, and in turtles, and in crocodiles, but not in our living dinosaur. Okay. so. In all of these cases, there are cartilage structures that are supporting those super squishy vocal folds that make sound. Have I lost you yet? Stay with me. Not yet. OK, good. I see some. So these are cartilage structures. And you can see salamanders, a frog, and a human. And they're suspended behind the tongue bone. And they support those super squishy vocal folds. But of all of these creatures, only within dinosaurs, do a totally new sound source evolve deep in the body cavity. So the way I want you to all remember this is that dinosaurs sing from the heart. OK? They don't actually sing from their heart, but their vocal organ, which is called the syrinx, is located right next to the heart. So if you point right where your heart is, that's where if you were a bird or you were a, dino, a, a, a bird or another dinosaur, you would find your vocal organ. It's pretty crazy, to me at least, and pretty unique. What's spinning in the upper corner is a croc, this is like a, a croc head steak. And those are the muscles that attach to the vocal folds in a crocodilian that are located at the end of the airway and are called a larynx. Same kind of thing we have. Why did dinosaurs get something totally new? Well, side note that I love, because I love history of science, is that the syrinx was named for a two-pronged panpipe. And it was called a panpipe because in Greek mythology, Pan chased a river naiad, kind of a, a, a young woman who was kind of a sprite. And she, to hide, she asked to be turned into the reeds to escape Pan. And he cut the reeds and made a pipe called Syrinx. Her name was Syrinx. And the name for the pipe was Syrinx. But the only definition of a Syrinx was as a sound producing organ. So instead of telling you, OK, now we're going to try to find a dinosaur Syrinx, it's a thing that makes sound. They're not telling you what it looks like. What do I look for? So my work had to come on the scene to say, what are we going to look for? What are we, how are we going to find this thing that's only defined as a sound maker? So we come into, I come into this, this work, and we know that the cousins of dinosaurs and living dinosaurs are noisy. They have what we call vocal behavior. And we know that living birds have a syrinx, but when does it arise? 
So one of my observations was that the, the cartilages that support the airway commonly fossilized in living birds. That's what's shown on the left. Those little ring structures like you might wear on your, on your fingers, those are cartilages that support the airway. But I had looked at thousands of d other dinosaurs and I had never seen those cartilage structures. And I looked for them. And I looked for them. So that got me to work that I started doing in around 2013, because science takes a while. And it was on a fossil that was a second specimen of a bird from Antarctica. This is our field site in Antarctica, where actually these fossils come from. And it's down in the Antarctic Peninsula, kind of pointing up towards South America. And this fossil had sat on my desk for a while because I didn't have time to work on it. It was a part of a species that I described already, and so I didn't really prioritize it. But I was looking at this fossil, and I was like, I can't identify what that tiny piece of bone. You're getting a picture of paleontology now. <laughs> I can't figure out what that tiny piece of bone with the red arrow and little question mark on it. What is that? So I asked a student to get me CT scans of that area. So that's where it is in this section. And that student's name was Brett. I have to tell you that because in a very, very big faux pas, I didn't put him in the acknowledgments of the paper. So Brett, thank you. So he made these images. And it looks like a ghost-like structure, but I was paying attention to these cartilaginous rings. And zooming in, I saw this thing that looked like those cartilaginous rings, but the part right where the sound maker is located. So if we go back to what I wanted to spin around, here we have a three-dimensionally preserved picture of the cartilaginous elements that support those super flexible vocal folds in birds. I was like, whoa, it made my day, it made my week, it made my year. And this fossil had been on my desk for years. So we had these three-dimensional data, but we had no data to help make sense of them. Because all we had were people mostly in the 19th century and early 20th century who did these wonderful illustrations. But they're not three-dimensionally preserved and they don't help us get at how the geometries relate to the soft, squishy vocal folds, which we needed. So we needed to start creating, using CT scans, totally new data types. And I should mention that the reason there were all these pictures of syrinxes, and that is what I just showed you, these are all syrinxes in different birds. The reason there were all these pictures is people thought they were the key to the evolutionary tree of birds. That's why they collected these pictures. And this is the evolutionary tree from back in 1888 when a lot of this work was done. The other problem I had with finding the first fossil syrinx was that most of the work was done on songbirds. Now songbirds are like your grackles, even though they don't sing pretty songs most of the time, that's a songbird. A crow, that's a songbird. A cardinal, that's a songbird. These are zebra finch. But the thing was, is that we needed other kinds of data. And all the textbooks showed me the syrinx of a songbird. Now songbirds are like the primates of mammals. They're really well nested within uh, dinosaurs. I needed data on dinosaurs like this. It, I would, you know, it could be. I mean, it could, this is a chicken. But <laughs> in fact, T-Rex was closer to this than we thought in the past. So we needed to know more about the vocal organs of birds that branched off deep in the avian tree. And we created whole new sets of data. And I love this video, I call it the magical voyage. And it gives you a sense of the kind of data that we can now get on the geometry and the relationship between the soft squishy structures, which are in purple in this case, and the cartilaginous structures, which are in gray. And so we traveled down the windpipe of a bird and now we're looking around at how those soft squishy structures relate to the structures that we get in the fossil record. So this was really new stuff. And so we could do all of these complex geometries and ask what the fossil was most similar to. And what did the fossil tell us 
not just a trombone is something that makes sound or a syrinx is something that makes sound, but what is a syrinx? So in fact, we found that this syrinx and the rest of the bony skeleton of the fossil was most closely related to living ducks and geese. This was from about 67 million years ago and was the earliest known syrinx found. But in fact, the syrinx in a second one from about 50 million years ago that we, said, that we also described that are in this group related to ducks, they're, I like to say, the Chevy Impala of syrinxes, not the Model T. But what they told us about was what the first, like that's an example of one of the earliest cars. They would tell us what to look for, what this thing might be, where might we find, might find it, and what its properties might be. So that was the big insight that this fossil had. But recently, there's another fossil that was just described that I want to tell you about because it only came out about two weeks ago. And that was this fossil. Wow. You know, spoiler alert. So this is an ankylosaur. Uh, it's part of the ankylosauridae. And this is the larynx cartilages. Those are the cartilages like us that surround and support our vocal folds in an ankylosaur. And what they argued in this paper was that they were bird-like. Let's take a look at that. So this is the study in the New York Times in which I was asked to comment. And I gave this reporter a bit of an earful. I said, this study is interesting. You measured a lot of larynx cartilages. That's cool. But in fact, there's no evidence in living dinosaurs, birds, that the larynx is ever involved in sound modification. The larynx is a valve that keeps food from going down into your lungs, ultimately. There's a, there's the, it's a primitively a valve that keeps that food from going in there. So my conclusion was, cool, but ankylosaurs are just weird. Because this is nothing about whether they had bird-like vocal production or anything else. So in fact, if these the authors looked at the cartilages, and what you can see is they're actually more lizard-like because the yellow thing is in front of the blue thing or the little sticky things, the things that look like toothpicks. So what we had done in a previous study was look at, here's your lizards, here's a turtle, a crocodilian, and these little things are called ceratobranchials. They're one of the tongue bones. We have them. Um, and here in birds, there's actually muscles that suspend the larynx behind these tongue bones. And that's the exact opposite of this dinosaur. This dinosaur has the larynx cartilages in front of these, rather like all of these dudes. Not like a bird. And this was cool because previous work we had done, led by my, uh, a, gra a graduate student of mine, had shown something super cool that we still can't explain, which is that uniquely in mammals, birds, and frogs, these are pretty vocal groups of animals, this suspension of the larynx occurs where it's suspended by muscles behind the tongue bones. This is what it looks like in humans, where you can see here's the tongue bones, and here's the, the cartilages of the larynx suspended behind it or in this case, down, because we're weirdly oriented as humans. So in fact, that dinosaur that was just described, the larynx is completely in a position only seen in lizards, not at all what is seen in birds. And the problem is also these authors fared to recognize that the larynx has never been demonstrated to shape sound. Remember we talked about sound shapers, resonating chambers? Those are sound shapers. It's never been shown the larynx itself to shape sound. So what do we know so far as we move into the last part of the talk today? So what we've found, and science is like this. Science, we have proximate conclusions. Can we say all dinosaurs made closed mouth sounds? No. <laughs> no. 
can we say that um, a syrinx is not present in the dinosaurs we haven't yet found it in? No. But what we can approach is when a syrinx might evolve, as I'll show you a little bit in a second, by thinking about other aspects of these organisms. And what we can also do, do is point out in the case of ankylosaurs, they are weird. And what that means is that if you look not just at the laryngeal, at the shape of these, car these things that support vocal folds, but if you look at the whole rest of the structure, it's not bird-like at all. So let's get into it. So one thing I can tell you is that T-Rex was not saying, Polly want a cracker. <laughs> I know that for, vari for various ways of reasoning. The ability to learn human speech is something that only evolved in three major groups of birds, living dinosaurs, parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds. Yeah, vocal learning. So not, that's very well nested. That's a late evolutionary event, as we like to say. The other problem with T-Rex saying Polly want a cracker is that we have to think about other aspects of this system. Birdsong is not just about the vocal organ or the vocal shaper, the track. It's also about respiration, continuous breathing. It's also about neuronal control, the brain. Let's talk a little bit for a second about the brain. What does it tell us? Well, if you see that tiny little purple thing in the top of that skull, T-Rex had a tiny brain. And in fact, that brain looked a lot more like a crocodilian than it did like any bird. So what you have is a very minimal, what's called forebrain. You'll see it in a second. But in any case, this brain is not, a lot of that control of sound production, sound learning, Polly want a cracker, that's in the forebrain. And their forebrain is super small. So if we look at the top, that's a velociraptor relative. You can see the relative sh in velociraptor and related taxa, the brain is bigger than T-Rex, and there is a bit of a forebrain, but it looks pretty different from living birds. That little sh nice shiny nugget of a green forebrain is in a living bird, and it's quite big compared to the other parts. It's stacked, and there's this new geometry. And my fabulous student, Chris Torres, did work on reorganization of the brain that we see in living birds and found it was super late in dinosaur evolution. That there were changes in the brain going on well after the evolution of flight. So this is stuff that I actually think has more to do maybe with sociality, with communication. Because when we talk about sound making, we're talking about communication. So what else might we look at to find another part of the dinosaur story? Let's look at hearing. Because if you make sounds, and sounds are about communication, who's hearing those sounds, for what purpose, and how? So you might not have been thinking about bird ears before this talk, but I sure hope you're thinking about them now. So that round hole behind the eye, that is the cassowary ear. That's the external part of that ear. Inside, the business parts of the ear create void spaces that can end up fossilizing. So we can actually look at the geometry of the hearing apparatus, as well as the geometry of the brain, as well as the geometry of the vocal organ, using CT data. That's x-ray data. So <clears throat> some people have done this for various groups of dinosaurs, and these are some of their complex figures. Let's, that pink thing there is the void space of the business part of the ear inside. And what they did is they emphasized, this is a paper from 2005, what would be the hearing of T-Rex. Is T-Rex big or small? Big. Good job. So, they estimated the best hearing estimate for T-Rex was around 600 hertz. I've given you a couple references. We actually took one of the clips from Jurassic Park and re-recorded its pitch. And it's right around 200 hertz. 
in the movie. If we look at an African elephant, they're going to be from making sounds that are around 16 to 50, and that's about what their hearing is tuned for, hearing other elephants. Let's think about that. Why do we hear? Why do we make sound? And the dinosaur about to eat the small children, who is he, he or she communicating with, or they? Who? Well, then you're telling all the other dinosaurs to come. I got a big meal here. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Anim bad thing. Animal communication is this. If you want to study something that's not paleontology, you might think about the whole field of this. But this, is, this was the only published estimate for dinosaur hearing. And there was also some work that was done that was quite interesting. It looked at holes in the skull, which we call pneumatic recesses, and concluded that, in fact, T-Rex was hearing very low frequency sounds. Huh. Now, 600 hertz is pretty high. Is that what T-Rex sounded like? Let's get into it. So when we talk about, we're talking about two different things, what they're hearing and what their, vocal, what their production is, what they're making. Generally, those are fairly aligned because mostly you're listening to other members of the same species. So if we look at this, and I need to point out something I don't like about this figure, is that this dolphin is way over here. This is a, a sound that's produced for a reason other than communication. It's what's called auto-communication. So if you're using it to find something in the dark, you're going to produce frequencies at a different level than social communication. I don't like that about this figure, but what you can see is infrasound is generally below 20 hertz. We cannot hear it. Elephants and that crocodilian I showed you are producing sounds in the infrasound. We don't hear them. We can feel them, but we can't hear them. So I've asked this question several times, but let's get one last answer as we get to the end of this. Are di many dinosaurs small or large? And not all of them. Some dinosaurs are smaller, but many dinosaurs are large. And I like this picture because this young woman is one of the hidden heroes of paleontology who was a preparator in the, the American Museum of Natural History back in the day, lost from history for many years, but she was preparing fossils. Here she is posed next to um, a bone from one of these very large dinosaurs. So one of the most important things I want you to leave thinking about, besides white-winged doves blowing up their esophagus to make cooing noises, is about the relationship between frequency and body size. And I don't know how so many dinosaur paleontologists missed this, but there's a very well-known relationship across all animals that the fundamental frequency, that is the pitch you produce, is related to size. You can alter that by evolving modifications for echolocation, for other reasons, but generally this relationship holds. And this is a paper from 2004 but actually, this study from 2015 actually measured the length of the vocal fold. That's the sound maker. And related it to frequency. So it's not body size, but it's the fact that the bigger you get, the longer the vocal fold gets, the lower the frequency. And you can think of this if I have a long string, and it's going to make a noise, noise like whoom, 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 whoom. If I have a short string and I move it like a piano string, it's going to make more like that. So it has to do with the physics of chord length and its relationship with body size. Now, T-Rex, the estimates of mass vary a lot, but it's about four elephants. So if we stacked four elephants on top of each other, are we going to get estimate the T-Rex produced sound at 600 hertz? Now, this is a log scale, so you can't directly compare it, but if I go back one, frequency in hertz. Elephants are around 50. What are you going to say about four elephants stacked on top of each other to make a T-Rex? Even lower, potentially. 
right? So it's interesting, elephants actually can produce sound between around 17 and, and 60 something hertz. And there is some variability. And I want you to think about elephants in a new way because what's coming off the front of their face? A trunk. Modifying sound. That's a sound modifier like those tubes and like the esophagus that we were talking about, as well as something that can be used in grabbing. It has many functions. So I'm going to conclude today with this trip we took. This was for a, a movie, a, a TV show called BBC's The Real T-Rex, I believe it was called, with Chris Packer. And we couldn't find the original whole video. But this is when we went into a sound studio in Berlin, where I was living at that time. And we had big speakers. And we estimated from that body size curve how low into the infrasound. These sounds we cannot hear, but we can feel. And we took crocodilian and bird sounds and we remixed them into much lower frequency sounds. What it meant was the only thing we could hear was the resonance frequency, not that pitch or that fundamental frequency. So I want to conclude with this today and play you the short video. And you're not going to get a true sense of the sound because we'd need those special speakers. What I really want you So, I don't know, that makes me sound kind of smart or something. Maybe that's why I played it. But Chris Packham's actually a cool guy who is neurodivergent um, and is proudly neurodivergent, and it was a pleasure to work with him on this clip. But I want you to get the sense that there is no evidence for an animal the size of a T-Rex that it would sound like a, like a human. And that the frequencies we see in movies are way, for way smaller animals. So maybe something like a velociraptor could make that sound, but a T-Rex, nah. So I want you to think about dinosaurs, extinct dinosaurs, and you think of them going, rawr. You're going to feel them in your, rather than hear them. You obviously weren't around when extinct dinosaurs, but if they bring one back to life, I think we would feel it rather than hear it. All right. So what do we conclude? Maybe don't roar. So one thing to think about with a roar is also that's a sound shaped by the mouth. Roar. The same sound is produced here, but it's shaped by our unique mammalian musculature around the mouth. They don't have that. So we're not seeing in reptiles that same kind of, as, as the same kind of shaping of sound in the mouth. So when we see this kind of picture one more time, because I have to play it and I'm in Texas, this is, I want you to think about it in a new way. And think, Texas is lassoing the truth about dinosaur town making. So that's why, I don't know, I thought that'd be kind of fun to conclude with. So I like to conclude my talks or start my talks by saying in a very clear way that science is not a solo enterprise. I might be the one in the room with Chris Packham on his video project, but science is the work of tons of students, of tons of collaborators, and we're all working together. If you like working with other people, or even if you like working by yourself, you could probably figure out a way to do that. But what I love is working with others. And science is made stronger by all of the personalities, all of the things that we bring to our science. That's my lab group over the last couple of years. I don't have everybody in there. Sorry, folks. But I want to point out that what I love about paleontology is that we do field discovery. We do geoscience. We do finding new fossils. But we also do a lot of lab work. We do a lot of bioscience. We look at a lot of living animals. And we work with, with animal communication experts. So we're working on all of those things together. 
And finally, if you want to, you just didn't get enough of my voice talking to you about crazy things, you can listen or read any of these other contributions we've done. I totally geek out about feathers in this book, What About Birds, more than you ever wanted to know about feathers in this book. So with that, I'd like to say a big thank you to Jay, and I'd like to open it up to, to any questions you might have. So that's it. We got a mic. We will can... take questions. Um, like, come down this aisle if you want to uh, ask a question. I'll give you the mic to ask a question. And if you stay to the end of the Q&A, we have awesome door prizes to give away. L keep, keep hold of that ticket you have. We'll be calling out numbers for that. So who has the first question? Come on down. Or just raise your hand, and if you're in the middle raise of the row, shout. We, can, we can get to you. Really, no questions? I got a question back here. What's your question? I'll repeat it. Are owls present-day dinosaurs? Yes, they are. They're super cool present-day dinosaurs. And one of the cool things about owls is they also make closed mouth sounds. They're one of the groups of birds that hoot, right? Hoo, 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 right? Closed mouth sounds, esophageal inflation. You didn't ask about that, but I'll let you know anyway. I'm going to get over there. And then the other thing that's cool about owls is that unlike most dinosaurs, not all, they are nocturnal whereas most dinosaurs were l active during the day. Okay, got a question over here. I'm coming over. Yes. Uh, do chickens actually originate from T-Rex? Do chickens originate from T-Rex? <laughs> great question. So indirectly, so as if like your great, 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 great grandmother has a lot of kids. So as if kind of like that, but not like directly like a T-Rex gave birth to a chicken. So that would be uncomfortable, for, I think, for the T-Rex. OK, or the chicken. Um, also, they would lay an egg, not give live birth. Just to say that. Yes? Out of all like, the media, like films and TV shows yeah. that like, involve dinosaurs, and all that, what do you think is the most accurate one that showed like, dinosaur sounds and all that? You know what? I have to say, there's a bunch of cool videos that I got into for this talk on the sound engineers on the first Jurassic Park movies. And they were actually really thoughtful, like that guy I played who was talking about all the sounds that were behind those dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, I think they went a little nuts with the Jurassic World ones. They're mixing in like 17 different animals. They put like a baby elephant, the baby elephant, but then there was like, they're mixing like tons of different animals into those sounds, in into the Jurassic World sounds. I think they got, they lost the thread a little bit. They were more into the science in the early movies, okay. weirdly. Hey, Julia, we have yes. a question yes, all the way yeah. over here. Yes. Are bugs technically dinosaurs? Are, are birds technically dinosaurs? Birds or bugs? bugs? Are bugs technically dinosaurs? Okay. Um, great question. N no. Um, bugs are awesome. They are what we call arthropods, and they branched off from dinosaurs more than like 500 million years ago. So like, not everything that's extinct is a dinosaur. Dinosaurs are one particular branch of the tree of life that includes living birds. So just like we are mammals, like a whale, like, like a, a, a fox, like a dog is a mammal, we're one part of mammalia, birds are one part of dinosaurs. Bugs are also cool though. Okay, I'm back here. Yes. Question, two questions in a row. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, um, how come birds are related to like T-Rexes and dinosaurs if when the dinosaurs went extinct, how did some survive and evolve into birds? That's my question. I have spent my career. So the question was, what about these birds that are around today and T-Rex is not around today. So what happened? Why did the group that includes birds survive and the ones that include T-Rex go extinct? 
I have literally spent my career on this question. I don't have a straightforward answer for you, but there's some aspects, maybe physiology, like growth rate. I know this is geeky, but like. Do I think pterodactyls might have been able to survive? They did not survive. We know they went extinct, and pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. They're dinosaur cousins. So great question. I think we need to keep it moving over there. Okay, I got like five different questions. So I'm going to go, you had your hand up early, then there, then here. Okay? And Julia, yes. be before you go there, Julia, let's yes. take one from here. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Is the hissing of snakes created in a different place than like the growling of a crocodilian? Yes. So, short answer. <laughs> um, snake, snakes are really, really, really cool. Um, so, you know, their larynx, I call it the snorkel tube. So, snakes have these distensible jaws and they can take in big pieces of food. I'm trying to look at my question asker. And they have a snorkel larynx because they need to put their breathing tube out of their mouth while they very slowly ingest a mouse, for example. So the hissing sound is, is created um, mostly with other par soft parts of their mouth rather than a vocal fold. And it's not very loud either. So it's fairly different in that regard. I'm yeah, I have we'll like... Take, while you're going up there. Okay. Okay. All right, what's your question? So, um, so how all animals are in the species, in categories of animalia, where would dinosaurs fall? I know they might be closer to aviary. Aves, yeah, so I could put the whole tree up, but essentially you have things that can breed away from water. They lay eggs that are hard-sided-ish. That's your, your, uh, your lizards and snakes, your mammals, even though we've lost egg laying in most mammals. You've got your crocodiles and your birds. They are all part of a group. And within that, the part of the tree I showed you is crocodiles most closely related to dinosaurs and birds are living dinosaurs. Pictures help. Lots of good stuff online. I got too many questions, but there was one way back there and then another one and this, then I'll come down here. This one comes from Lhasa High School. Okay. Uh, would you say the extinction of dinosaurs was most likely caused by volcanism or <laughs> by impact? There's a lot of laughter about that question. I have no idea why, because it's a great question. Um, what we know about the extinction of dinosaurs, non-bird dinosaurs, is that you have two events. You have major volcanism before, and then you have an impact event on top of that. And the, the, the death blow seems to be the, the impact, the meteor impact. So the volcanism is causing rapid environmental change. And whenever we have extinction events like this, what we're talking about is very rapid environmental change that's global in nature for a group like dinosaurs that lived all over the world to go extinct. That's what we're talking about in a mass extinction event is very important for us to know Fred. but both are likely important and the meteor um, dip delivered the death blow I know there was a question here so I'm going here next yes when did the dinosaurs pass away when did the dinosaurs pass away 66.6 .6 million years ago oh. there you go it's a long time it's Remember a long question time here. ago okay question over here are fish technically dinosaurs Alas, no. <laughs> so dinosaurs are part of this group of organisms that live on land, and the fish we have today, so in some ways, you could say dinosaurs are fish, but fish aren't dinosaurs. Think about it. I'm just going to leave you with that one. All right. What's my next question here, oh, Jay? Over here. Okay. You stated earlier that dinosaurs, as far as we know, were not nocturnal. What not is your evidence or by inference? Okay, so um, basically that whole group, that in, most of them are diurnal because they have a, a pretty, like living dinosaurs, for example, have a really highly developed visual system. 
And in owls, they've, they've gone to nocturnality. They're very different from something like a mammal, like us in our group, that was living in the dark for a while. Nocturnal. Now, were any dinosaurs, noc extinct dinosaurs, nocturnal? There's some evidence that suggests that they might have been. I think it's a fairly uncommon strategy in, di in extinct dinosaurs. And that's based on some, the, some argument for some dinosaurs being uh, a nocturnal is based on eye socket proportions. That's the kind of evidence used. But most of them, that whole group is pretty diurnal overall very well-developed visual system. Okay, oh my gosh, this is, we're gonna have to end these questions because it's like 25 questions. So Jay, we are gonna have to decide when we do the door prizes, but there's we'll like do the door prizes in this soon. area. This yeah. is Hart Elementary. Okay, Hart uh, Elementary in the house with good questions. I love to see it. Their All representative right. has a question. Okay. Um, if chickens are like cousins to the T-Rex, why can't they roar? Wow, wow, great question. <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> First of all, the T Rex didn't roar. Uh, roaring, roaring itself is a mammalian thing, as I thought I got there. But chickens have a syrinx. T Rex might have had a syrinx, we don't know yet. Um, but in any case, the chickens are making really complex, awesome noises. A T-Rex should be jealous of what a chicken has because they've got big brains, they have complex repertoires of sounds they can produce, they are pretty social if you've had a chicken, so T-Rex should be jealous on that one. That was a good question, though. <laughs>